in Karachi, Pakistan. As a medical student intern, he was involved in a family relief organization working in the Sarah Parker Desert region of Pakistan. Dr. Khan joined the Department of Family and Community Medicine at Baylor College of Medicine in 1999. Prior to becoming program director, Dr. Khan was actively involved in both the pre-doctoral program and the international health program within the department. He stepped down from being program director after six years and is now the associate residence director and residency faculty and is also, faculty is also in charge of residence professional development. He also serves as faculty mentor for Gold Humanism Honor Society for Residents at Baylor College of Medicine. He is also the director of undergraduate medical student elective courses at Baylor College of Medicine, care of the underserved, sub-internship in family medicine, history of medicine, and international health. Along with the above-mentioned roles, as of November 2017, he, was a dual he has had the dual appointment of Vice Chair of Community Health and Assistant Chief of Staff for Harris Health Ambulatory Care Services. He serves on the board of two nonprofit organizations, Houston Shoulder to Shoulder, a nonprofit that benefits rural outdoors. The organization has constructed a large clinic in a very rural frontier community, and he travels to Indoors at least once a year with Baylor students and doctors on mission trips. He is the president of the Touch Base Center for the Deaf and Blind, a nonprofit and day habilitation facility that aims to bring the community and joy into the lives of adult deaf blind individuals and those who care for them. In addition to his clinical and teaching responsibilities, he served as principal investigator on two grants funded by the United States Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources, and Services Administration. Dr. Khan and his wife of 30 years, Rubina, a pediatrician, have five children, the three biological children, Tanya, Sarah, and Asad, and two adopted children, Jennifer and El Salvador. His oldest daughter, Tanya, is deafblind. He and his wife are active in the deafblind community in Texas and are the recipients of numerous community awards. The family has three dogs, a cat, and many tropical fish. They love traveling and have visited over 30 countries with pleasure. They enjoy the outdoors and own a country property just outside of Houston. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Dr. So lots of thanks, really. Uh, thank you to Joanna Fields for leading the Compassion and the Art of Medicine course. Uh, thank you for you all choosing this elective. Uh, thank you for the audience. Uh, the reason the thanks is really important is when I went to med school on April 15, 1980, there wasn't a course like this. There wasn't a conversation about this, about compassion. It doesn't matter which rabbit hole you want to go down, there, there was no conversation. You were told what to do, and medicine was a serious field, and that was all it was, and the seriousness was the knowledge that you acquired. Uh, so, um, I have an immensely large slide, and the folks here tell me that because we're going into the small group session, I can go over my time, but I still want to honor people who may want to leave at a certain point. And so, I really want to try and go through this in a fast clip. Therefore, can you hold your questions till the end? Um, I know that there'll be questions and there'll be concepts to clarify. Um, this is the clicker. Okay. So, um, so Joanna, do you think I can put this on, please? Because I, I tend to move when I have some nervous energy here. So. <laughs> Testing. Oh, yes. Yeah. Great. 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 Be too much here. Okay, so uh, the talk is entitled Tanya's Life Story and the Inspiration of the Touch Base Center for the Deaf Mind. This is a new topic, and uh, the talk has been called All Sorts of Things. So, uh, Rubina, my wife, uh, a pediatrician uh, that works now for Legacy but has had her own clinic for the longest, uh, had uh, Tanya when she was her third year resident. Um, uh, we um, 
I, uh, as, as you just heard, I do a lot of different things uh, in the community. I'm the vice chair of community health for the last year. Um, the talk is not about anything specific. You may take specifics home. The talk is about your own journeys. Everybody has a, has a story. Everybody has something. This talk is not meant to insult another speciality. It's not meant to somehow state or overstate a certain disease versus another disease. It's not as if one disease is more burdensome somehow than another. It's really, I, although it can sound like that sometimes, I really want you to concentrate on what I have to say in generalities, and at all times, think of your own story. Think of what you have seen at, at some point. No one's paid me for this, and no, I, I, they couldn't pay me enough. Uh, not in the sense of what I mean is I really want to do this. I really love to do this, and I do it in many different forums. I do it for teachers, I do it for uh, students, I do it for deafblind families. There's many places. And this is only my opinion. This is not anyone else's opinion. You don't need, you can disagree with me as much as you want. It's a journey. Everyone has a journey. It's about coping. It's about how we coped. It doesn't mean that you cope in that same way. It's about experiences and lessons learned. And I will preach because I'm a daddy and I like to say what the lessons are. It's okay if you again don't want to take those lessons home. It's about attitude, and it's my attitude about healing, what I believe is medicine, and what healing is. And it's about support systems that brought us through this. It's about beliefs. Can you take my phone, Ali? Thank you. It keeps buzzing. Too many emails. It's about showing our baby pictures, because every daddy wants to do that, right? It's about stimulating thought and conversations. This is what this course is about. You are blessed. It's about motivation, and it's about pot. Now, it's legalized in, in, in California, and you know we can talk about that a lot, but it's a little different. It used to be called Hell and Hell Revisited. It was a journey from darkness to light. And even then I said, we never saw any light, and we never saw any darkness. It's somewhere in between. Please don't get into the hyperbole of everything. It's a retrospective journey. Tanya was just celebrated on Tuesday, October 16th, her 25th birthday. It, this, it's a difficult one to talk about. So let's start with Helen Keller, the, the most famous deafblind individual that you know of. There's no better way to thank God for your sight than by giving a helping hand to someone in the dark. As doctors and healers, you will be giving and helping and someone in the dark. That will be your sole mission, probably. This is a slide set that will brainwash you, that will embed you into your minds that disability is not a handicap. It's a success, that we have achieved success. You may not see Tanya today. She's sitting in front of the audience and think that she's a success. But I can vouch for it, and you will come take that home. That's important for physicians to see their work is a success. Success, success, success. You've been messaged. Okay, we created Touch Base Center for the Deafblind two years ago. Touch Base Center for the Deafblind is for people with deafblindness and those who support them to build connections with the community, which is what we're doing right now, promote self-respect, improve communication and daily living skills while creating moments of joy. Oh, some simple moments of joy, it's key. We live daily lives, and moments of joy need to be inserted into it for our lives to be meaningful. Without that, our lives are not meaningful. Think about it. Your shelf exams are not necessarily the most meaningful thing you did. All right, so here's Touch Base Center. Uh, and here are plenty of activities. There's exercise that Tanya is doing, there's pottery that Tanya is doing. Uh, there are people come to an open house in, the, in one of the slides. Um, there is Dr. Hamad Namu, who is a geriatrician. Uh, there, there are some board members. And there's a big sign that says, do with, not for. What does that mean? That just means, please don't think they can't do it. Try to get them to do something. We'll talk about what that disability is. You don't even know that as yet. I don't even know that as yet. 
how, how can any one of us know what, what deaf blindness is? But it is a success journey because now we have that base center for the deaf blind, and it's a unique thing. And it's paid for by medic, uh, by rehab and stuff. But I have a challenge. I don't. How can I do this without really giving you biases? This is not an easy talk. So, premature birth. I, um, Tanya was, if anything before 37 weeks was premature birth. Rubina has pre term rupture uh, membranes, and Tanya was brought into this world. We now can call it three term, we can call it whatever, but really, this child was not supposed to be in this world at that time. It was not equipped, had lenuco hair, did not look like a human being. This was not somebody who needed to be out. So let's use descriptive terms like the British used to use sometimes, because let's recognize that, that is a challenge. So October 16, 1993, Tanya was born at Methodist Hospital. Her Abgars were dismal, there were zeros and twos. Uh, she wasn't supposed to survive, but there was a team of people that rushed in. Rubina had spent already 10 days in hospital uh, fighting uh, uh, fever and uh, trying to keep Tanya in. Tanya came out, supposedly 25, 26 weeks, maybe even earlier, who knows. Uh, but she was really not equipped. She was whisked to the panel system to Texas Children's Hospital. Be thankful for all these resources that you have around you. Uh, and uh, she was 800 grams. Uh, she was that small, um, we'll describe that. And she was in neonatal intensive unit for 10 and a half months. She came out of this 10 and a half months and she went back in for one month again. So she was there for a year. I want you to know that no one gave us hope that she would live. There was no hope that Tanya would ever live. That's a difficult one. Doctors are taught, taught maybe not to give false hope, but hope and false hope. We'll talk about that. So what happens as soon as this premature baby comes out? You take this little infant, you wrap them up at least 20 years, 25 years ago, 25 years ago, and you wrap them up in saran wrap. You give them phenobar so that they're not stimulated at all. It's called min stim protocol. No stimulation. Nothing. No touching. Nothing. Sure, the ICUs are noisy and alarm bells are going off and everything, but this is what you're supposed to do. So they don't get intraventricular hemorrhages. And we thank God because Sanya had very small intraventricular hemorrhages, if at all. However, what does a mama do? What is Rubina doing? She's a third year resident at Texas Children's Hospital. She completed her residency while her baby was in ICU. Up on that floor and down on this floor. She pumped her breast with Tanya wasn't going to drink the milk. But what is she doing? She's touching the baby. Mainstream protocol is your protocol. It wasn't a parent's protocol. A parent needs to touch. There's a lot that happened even before she got there. Rubina had a little bit of postpartum depression. She knew, oh no, what was going to happen. She knew because she was a pediatric resident. I was oblivious. We had to take her to the ICU in a wheelchair two days later to first see her baby. We had to wait five, seven days before we could open, I could open my shirt and do something called skin to skin, which is huge bonding, which we now straight away throw a baby onto people's stomachs. But we didn't have that then. And if you look at this picture, there's a thousand things in this picture that I want you to focus on. There's a little uh, clown doll. That doll was about this big. That doll was smaller, uh, uh, was larger than Tanya that somebody gave. There's a little blue bag under the ICU, uh, under the oxygen and the uh, uh, ventilator pipes. Uh, that is a bag with a Quran, a cross, a, any mumbo jumbo that anybody gave. My mom was in Pakistan and she was send, sending letters. That was in there. Whatever anybody gave us hope, we put in there. What do parents do? They need hope. Somebody gives you something, you put it there. Okay, so there's Tanya. And she's I want you to focus on the slide because it's not only a perspective. That's a credit card, that's a sock, that's a pencil, and Tanya was too small to wear any of this. But there's a story behind the story. A nurse made it. I do not know that nurse's name. I probably never thanked her. 
she made it with hope. That was a present. That's a little ribbon for her head being shaved and all the IVs that were going in her head. That is compassion. That is love. So then Tanya grows. Tanya has this uh, clown on her tummy. And, and she's grown, she's got a diaper on, and you know, she's still intubated. And she was most of her life intubated. She got bladder trauma, we'll talk about that. Well, that's my mom. She's passed seven years ago. She left everything in Pakistan, everything got ransacked. She went from a rich lady with a Rolex and a Mercedes to nothing, and actually ended up as a Harris Health patient. The chief of staff is sitting right here. And she gave it up. Why do these families do that for their families? But here is an uh, ench enchanted rock in, in, in near Fredericksburg. And we climbed that. And this is not why I'm showing you the slide and she's splashing the victory. I'm showing you the slide because in the foreground, in this little piece, is Tanya's oxygen. We took Tanya up. Nobody will stop a family from trying to climb the mountain. So everyone who I asked to stand, and you guys didn't hear me, can you please stand for a quick second, please? Alicia, please. Dr. Zaire, can you please stand up? Please, please, please. Salman, come on. Asad, Osvaldo, thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks. So, we talked about part. People of Tanya, others sitting here, my grandfather, uh, my father-in-law, uh, Tanya's grandfather, everyone is here. These are people of Tanya. There's a concept. There's a concept that it takes a village to grow in. It's, it's a concept that we in medicine don't allow. Oh, you've allowed one visitor. You're allowed this. This is how we function. 1993, part people of Tanya were founded. And uh, it's family, friends, well wishes, anybody. Whoever wants to come in, therapist, whoever, whoever. Jerry's here, uh, my Leah's here, she's the touch base coordinator. All of them, you may come in, everything and anything for Tanya. We will use you and abuse you. We want something for Tanya. We will take it. Rustam is here, another person of Tanya, all the way from 30 years ago. All right. The admissions policy has just come on in. The other policy is we will move on, but you can never leave. All right, you can never leave because you are a person of Tanya. You've been you've been infected. So there's Grandma, Oma, uh, and Hildegard Peach came all the way from Germany. She never spoke a word of English, not a lick, not yes, not no. She came. She never left Germany, but she came for ten days, uh, and she came. And this is the first day that Tanya was outside the ICU and seeing the sun. But actually, not outside the ICU. It's right in the center of Texas Children's. There's a little atrium, and she's in there. And everyone is smiling. Forget about that. There's grandma, there's grandpa, there's my mom, there's me and Rubina. All right? Everyone's smiling, because that's a great day. It wasn't a great day, because Tanya was sick for months afterwards. And here's that. The people of Tanya and Lucenta, what I mean by that is these are the nurses. These are the ICU nurses, the people we left far behind. Linda in the foreground, she's she there in that photo? No, Linda's not there. She'll be there in another photo. She passed for breast cancer. Some of them kept in touch with us. Okay, there's Linda and that on the far next to the stroller. The people of Tanya who gave her life, who worked and fought for her, gave her presence. They gave us gifts. We don't give them gifts. They gave us gifts. So we have to thank people. Look at that slide. We went on a journey. This is only a one-year journey. I'm talking about a 25-year journey. So let me tell you a few anecdotes. This is, again, not meant to demean. You know what Tosadis, the point is, or you will know, that when your electrolytes go out of whack. So Tanya had what is called barrel trauma. So she was intubated for so long, she developed a bleb on her lung. So because she's that small, the, the, this bubble in her lung was that big that it, she couldn't breathe. And because of that, all the electrolyte imbalances, whatever, it's a big story. But Dr. Hansen, who was the head of Neo IC, sat and bagged her with a, you know, an apple bag 
instead of a ventilator, because that little dead space was going to make the difference. But Tanya was dying. But potassium was eight. Do we ever hear from potassium over eight? No. But calcium's wrong. Everything was off. And medicine kept trying to die her. They were doing their best. I never interfered in Tanya's care. Rubina never interfered in Tanya's care. But that day she was dying. And so we told people, we told a fellow, would you please call Dr. Jed Nutton and Tom Jackson? They were surgeons. They had done a lot for Tanya before. Would you please call them? And the guy in the morning rounds looked at me, gave me a look, and walked away. The same fellow, I don't know his name, looked at me at five in the evening and asked him the same question. Can you please call Dr. Jackson? This is the next day. She hasn't died as yet because of the valiant efforts of bagging her. And he said, are you an idiot? Would you, who would operate on a potassium of eight? To his credit, I'm giving him full credit. He called Jed Nutton and Tom Jackson. They came after a 16 or 17 hour surgery, but being on call because there were no duty hour rules there. They came. And Tom Jackson looked at Tanya, looked at that, and he said, there's nothing to do but to operate. He said, didn't say, go to get this down, I'm going to go rest. And they make the ICU into a little, they make the ICU bed into a little operating theater. They cracked open a chest, and all the numbers became okay, because it was just a mechanical thing. It was just a mechanical thing. That's a hero. That's a hero, at least to a family. He didn't worry that we would sue him because she would die. Tom Jackson came to the rescue many times. She had necrotizing enterocolitis. Every time he would do a surgery, he, he would go in and take a little piece of bowel, and then he would come and sit next to us in our place and say, I did what I could do for my doctor, for my daughter. I did what I could do. I saved the ileocecal valve. I could do this much. She'll be fine. She'll be fine. And he couldn't even close her abdomen because of the eight hour long surgery she was given. 800, 8,000 cc's of fluid, she was not 8,000 cc's, so she was all edematous. But it closed by secondary intention. So he did what he could. One day, I, Tanya came home from a major surgery with an IV in the middle of the chest. Do you, any of you know a sternal vein? Do you, any of you know this is not an intraosteous IV? They tried and tried. I've seen nurses try 35 times and say, this is not my lucky day. Can you try? They have cried because they couldn't get her an IV. That is a hero. That is somebody. They don't ration themselves. People give. I don't know that anesthesiologist's name. I can never go back and thank them. I can only pass it on to you. We think medicine is an exact science. Is it an exact science? Nobody could tell us the time he was dead. Nobody can tell us that Tanya was dead. We went to audiology, we went to acoustic brainstem responses, we did all sorts of things. Yeah, we knew she was dead because she had a milieu of, of uh, autotoxic drugs and Lasix and all sorts of things, and she would be dead, of course she would be. But the fact of the matter is we couldn't prove it. We had to wait all the way to going to Holland to the Institute of Duke Linden a long time later when a little man came and said, oh, I'm sorry Dr. Jan Van Dijk is not here, told me you are coming all the way from U.S. what can I do for you and put us in a sound field room and within two minutes he said, ah, do you see that? Did you see that? She, she, she turned towards that a little. She has a little hearing. Yeah, she can hear an aircraft engine and she can probably hear something else. But that little is a lot for the family. And we fought with hearing aids and then we fought with cochlear implants later. But what I mean to say is it's not necessarily an absolute pronouncement that we will make in medicine. It's not. There she's very into hearing it. And she went, she, Tanya liked to do this. She didn't like to walk on grass. So she would go one foot on the grass with my mom and one foot down on the pavement. And she would walk like this and she would throw her hearing aids. And then the whole family, these people of Tanya, would be looking in Westbury for her hearing aids or whatever, whatever it was. People would go through a lot. The death of an eye is a really important story. It's an important story not because it belittles someone or makes someone great. Tanya slowly got advanced rush disease and she got uh, 
uh, retinopathy of prematurity, but she got it much later. She didn't get it right in the beginning. So at first we thought she had good sight and, and this didn't happen. She had all the scleral buckling procedures, all sorts of procedures, lasers. So in one surgery, this very great retinal specialist, whose name is on the chapters, thank God in the city we have all this, came out in the middle of a long surgery and said to me, I'm sorry, there's almost no retina left, there's nothing, there's maybe a little attack on the nasal field. I tried my best, I can't do anything. And I said, but her eye is shrinking, it's dying, it's undergoing tysis, and her face is misshapen. Oh, sorry, he said that. Her eyes is undergoing tysis, there's not enough pressure there. And it's going to be misshapen in her face. And I said, but she's a pretty girl, she'll need that. And he said, he looked at me strangely. He said, you want me to do something about it? I said, yeah, you, can you? And so he released the entrapment of the ciliary body. And to his credit, the face is not misshapen. She's a pretty girl. And, but you know, it, it was a question that was outside his technical field, maybe, but it was within his expertise. And he did it. And it's an important thing. So ask the family what you want sometimes. So my sister is right here. And she kept saying, pretty little thing, honey, at home. Ten and a half months later, I did my FM gems, which was the US Emily equivalent, on the day that Tanya came home. I ran all the way to the ICU because I was going to get Tanya to come home. I didn't score very well. I won't take myself into my own residency, but that's a different story. I passed. Uh, that's important. But don't worry. Don't worry about the scores. Uh, so I became the program director of the program that didn't take me. They told me that it's going to file 30 in my application. Anyway, that's the difference. So, so, so Tanya, she kept saying, we'll bring a limo, we'll bring a limo, and there was a stretch limo outside. Why? Because we need to celebrate these things. And there was that little sight, and she could see her cakes, and she could see her birthdays. And there's Rubina, pregnant again, and what happened with Sarah? She's sitting right there, all gorgeous and everything else. What happened? AT&T truck went into her and she had premature labor and we said, oh no. But we gave ourselves permission and thank God everything was okay. The same, the same obstetrician, the same every. And then we had another, Asad. Asad's there, back there. And then, many years later, three years ago, we gave ourselves permission to adopt Jennifer. And we were pregnant again, and we adopted through Child Protective Services. And it's been the biggest delight. And then we went on a trip to Jennifer, and there's Alia, where's Alia? Raise your hand, okay. There she is, she's with us, and we've done a trip driving to New Mexico and Santa Fe in summer, and, and you know, the family has done things. And there's Oswaldo, he's sitting right back there. And Oswaldo's been a pleasure, I don't know, and uh, he's 14, and he came to us two years ago, all right? Um, and that's my birthday, my 57th birthday, and Oswaldo's in my lap, and the whole family's together. The people who come here constantly, and Nana is right there, Grandpa is right there, and there are other friends, and there are, you will see them, and there I didn't put all the photos. And their birthdays, and their celebrations, right? This is Tanya's first big walk. Look at the giant steps. We were told she would never walk again. We were told that because of a necrotizing enterocolitis, she would never eat or poop. I am happy to say she does, all right? <laughs> we were told by a team of surgeons when Tom Jackson couldn't come one day, this is PD Short that's coming out from her bandages, and she has enterocutaneous uh, fistulas this is it, this will never heal. We just have to ignore them and wait for Tom. Because that is not how you deal with people. You don't come and pronounce in two minutes somehow and no. Never say never. Please don't say never. Even at the last minute. Give them hope. Give them something. Please. So Tanya walked. This is an immensely powerful slide, and you will not know that. I didn't know it when I took this photo. I did not know what this meant. This is Tanya taking herself for a walk. Imagine the world of deaf blindness. You don't know where you'll trip, where you'll fall. She's taking herself. She has fallen downstairs. She doesn't do that anymore. She's older. She 
has chosen sighted guide. She's chosen somebody's elbow as reinforcements, and you hold her head down, and then you still try to put in food, and you still don't get it in. Because she had a hyper gag. You touched her here, and she gagged for a minute. And we, we took these vibrating toys and stimulants and slowly, slowly moved the gag back over years. And then she bit back. <laughs> but look at this slide. I've come from work, white shirt. That's not the only thing. Look at what we, what, where her glasses are. You fight some battles and you don't fight other battles, <laughs> right? <laughs> I have neighbors who have more money than whatever. And they brought artificial snow. So never say never that it doesn't snow in Houston, all right? Uh, never say never because Tanya, who hates the shaky ground, is taken with Pamela. Pamela was a teacher at the School for the Blind. We drove for seven years back and forth to get to School for the Blind. So it's a magical world of their blindness. You suddenly ask for chocolate cake in the cup years. You ask for cookies. You ask for M&Ms, and they appear. It's such a great world. None of us know how that happens. None of us know how that happens, but it's a really terrifying story. So we go to Venice, Italy. There's Sarah looking out from the airport. We're taking the water taxi. There is my Campari and Soda Daddy really needs it. Uh, there, is, uh, there is the gondolier in the background. But Tanya is like, I don't know what this is all about. I've just taken a long flight, and I'm not sure. Well, there's never a camera for the bad times. There's never a camera for the bad times. So what happened? Tanya made such a scene, I think all of Venice was looking at us. She wouldn't get out of the, and the gondoliers wanted to take that taxi with that 100 euros again, and they tried to pick her out, and people's clothes were coming on. It was a misery. And what did we think? We said, oh, we should have done this. We are stupid people. Why do we persevere with somebody? Why do we do this? Because we want experiences. Well, she's having ice cream and everything is good in her world. We are exhausted and I haven't even drunk my Campari and soda as yet. <laughs> All right. There's Tanya in with her chocolate cakes and her 18th birthday. So it's a scary world. It's a scary word. Whenever the doctor touches, you go into a doctor's office and they want to touch you. She smelt a rat as soon as she came here. How does she know that you're telling her the truth? You've taken her and then fooled her and tricked her into doctor's procedures all her life. You've put her under anesthesia. So she really wants to know. And she didn't have communication because deaf blindness is a real difficult thing. The first time we gave her communication was a little piece of Velcro, and she was six years old, and we'd said D on her hip, and she was. That was the first word, diaper, that we were going to change. The communication that is happening right now and that you will see later is a huge amount of effort by a million people. So, in a down okay, and windmills, we don't know. Skylab is supposed to fall on our heads. We are all afraid of the unknown. Tanya is that much more afraid. She has no context. She can't go to a Chinese restaurant and expect that she won't get ice cream. I mean, Osvaldo got ice cream yesterday at the Chinese restaurant, but that's a different story. Uh, so, for the first time, she touched the ceiling. She's touched in our country property, she's touching the ceiling. What an imagine, what a fantastic world. This full floor is up on the top. Okay, so it's scary. The first time Tanya flew, she was eight or nine years old. Do you know the difference between Portland, Oregon, and Seattle? It's nothing. The pilot came back after clearing the whole first class compartment. Who clears first class people? because she was kicking down that door. She hated that flight. He came to me and said, should I emergency land? Because she hated it. She was not restrained. I had back pain for months after that because I was trying to hold her down. The next few times, she flew, she flew. Now then she became a gold elite for continental. <laughs> Families, it was continental, then it was united. So what is it? What is the problem with deaf blindness? If you don't know anything, every touch, and there are millions of touches, are so, so much. It's just overwhelming. And there are all sorts of things. There are comfortable touches and bad touches. And touch is everything. But you don't realize how much touch is to you unless someone in the middle of the night touches you and then you don't know who they are. Then you would know immediately if somebody that. But we all use touch, we just don't, it's not the sense, sense that we, but she uses, that's her modality. Oh, did I need to cancel? Or this? Okay. All right, so, camera's for the good times, right? 
We're there, we put a little blanket, Tanya's all tactile and defensive, we're sitting with an oxygen bag in Kima or wherever, uh, Freeport, yeah. and, and we're trying to enjoy the beach because we really need to get out of the house. What you don't know is a gust of wind came. All the sand blew in her face. She fell into the sand, and we had to leave and drive back because it was a miserable experience. Is it a miserable experience anymore? No. She has been exposed to it. She enjoyed it. She likes the sand. She likes the sand. She likes the sand. She likes the beach. She likes touching all these funny things that don't make any kind of sense. <laughs> Look at this one. <laughs> what is so important about this? It's not that she's just touching, unfortunately named Osama, uh, head, but what she is uh, doing, she's sitting on the grass. Grandma did it, I didn't do it. And here she is in Alhambra, Spain, touching the wall and making the best of her trip. Is that a success? This is Wigelen Park, Norway. She's touching the statues. What she gets out of it, I don't know, but she's getting something. It's a beautiful place. This is the National Mall in Washington, and she's touching again. She has fun. Please don't underestimate her. Okay. So what is, this, what is her modality of talking? You won't have that necessarily. It's sign language, but it's tactile proactive sign language. It's in her hand. It's, it's how you give it to her. And it's been built, and thank God for tax dollars. Tax dollars with cruise missiles is not a good use. Tax dollars for the Texas School for the Blind that just got their five-year grant renewed today is an excellent thing. I wrote the letter of support. I used Baylor. Baylor says don't do it. I used Baylor's logo. I used Harris House logo. I used my, all my titles because that's what you do. You support things that get you somewhere. And that's Pamela at Texas School for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Should school really be that easy? I mean, this was not easy. These are concepts that have been built. It looks like fun that she's pushing a rabbit around. She actually had a little business at school. She would take bottled water and go to the store, get these big canisters, put them in a cart, and take them and then collect dollar bills and fish, you know. And unfortunately, the United States doesn't have real on its currency, European currencies do. But anyway. So what do you take away from all this? It's about humanism and compassion. Let's let's talk about that. The third side the, the point is the world of medicine and the world of surgery collided that day. Did you know all the answers? No. Please don't pronounce it. You don't know all the answers. You may think you know all the answers, come to it with an open mind. There's this gentleman, his daughter's deaf, and he told me, hey listen, you've got a technical concern. As soon as somebody has a chest pain, you want to go into all these things. Can you really just talk to me for a minute? We have Patients have a different expectation, doctors have a different expectation. These words don't necessarily mean. We need to try and meet. Tanya really doesn't like that cochlear that we gave her. She said mama and a few other things, but she doesn't need it. She chose another modality. Don't blame her. You've chosen different lifestyles, you've chosen different things. Let her choose what she wants. Don't think, oh my God, poor thing, one day technology will fix her. She's fixed as best as she can. We hope for more. Let's not fix. Just give the family a little respect. Don't demand things. Give them a little time. There's death blind time. There's death blind time. Never say it was for the best. What kind of nonsense is that? It's, it's never for the best. Do I wish this on anyone else? No. OK. Hope, ask, expectations. What do you want? What's your? ability to do right now. Can you do this? Can you partner with me? Physicians need to ask the patient. We need to do that. Don't underestimate or overestimate your patients. Just work with them. It's a lifelong journey. I'm lucky I'm in family medicine. I have relationships with patients. But anyway, you get the point. If all of us live long enough, we're all going to be that way, all right? But, uh, if we are the ones who are not getting her disability, then who's at fault? Is she at fault? Because she suddenly, you know. So there's the guy who put her cochlear implant. It said it's a la -di da practice of ENG. He insulted us and threw us out because she did not fit the profile of that clinic. Everyone
everyone so pretty and so nice in that place. And so he assaulted him. We didn't sue him or anything like that. But Rubina told, told him exactly what to do with himself and wrote him a long letter. Because that is what you do when people suddenly don't want this. All I'm trying to tell you is, she, he put in the cochlear, and then she wasn't using it, and so then we went, went back to him and said, maybe the cochlear doesn't work, maybe this is a technology failure. And so he got really irritated. For some reason, we didn't be very respectful people. I don't think we did anything, but he just basically did that. So sometimes we have really bad examples. We're trying to speak for the good examples. I'm going to move from this slide. If you have CHF and congestive heart failure and end-stage renal disease and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's much worse than if you have any one of those diseases. We know that, right? Well, this is a dual sensory impairment, so obviously it's a little worse because she doesn't have the world is closed from her. It's nothing that's going in. It's a dual disability, so it's a double whammy. We understand that. But look at this, Sarah and us, us is looking on, Sarah's going to be hopefully a compassionate physician, I told her not to be, but you know, not to, not to be not compassionate, not to be a physician. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, but this is what's happening, and we're in the garden of life, we're there with the blue bonnets. Okay, can you predict with any accuracy, any outcomes? You know, never poop in a diaper, never get off the bench, so on and so forth. I need you all to take home something today. I told you I wasn't going to give you some take homes, but I will. When you play the peripheral part, understand that you're playing the peripheral part in someone's illness because they are living with illness. And understand that if you can name it, they can get resources. If you can go out and do a little extra, then they will get that. So you must guard against rationing yourself and not going down roads that you don't understand. Just say, don't say how much I can do, say, I'll try to do as much as I can. That's a different way. Life's like a box of chocolates, right? You never know what. So we got this box of chocolates. Don't feel bad for us. Please don't feel bad for us. We've we tried to impress you in the beginning that this is success, and we've done very well, and there's a Tesla outside, and so on and so forth. <laughs> All right? Uh, we've traveled 40 countries, and you know. But you must invest as a physician a little more than what you're given. And you will have now modern day tools. You have up to date and resources and patient handout. You can give them more. Give them family groups. Give them something more than just your medical knowledge. If you don't do it, what's the what is this is a compassion dog, right? What happens? You're perceived as ignorant, selfish. That is what is happening around this country. Patients think doctors are all, all in it for the money. Please don't be like that. All it is, is a little more humanism. Why is it important to name it? I didn't know that Tanya was deaf blind. I thought she was deaf and blind until she was four years old. It took from four years till today for me to try and understand that deaf blindness is a totally different entity. In that, we met the governor Rick Perry, we went to the governor's house in Austin, we passed the deaf blind project, we actually, uh, I didn't do it, the Deafblind Multi Handicap Association of Texas, with Deborah Cartman, one of our board members, did this. But we went, Tanya went, and we advocated for things. But how would we get those resources? How would we get Jerry Steinbart? How would we get that if we didn't have it? By the way, Texas is a really backward state in most things, but not for deafblindness. It's one of the leading places in the world because of these fantastic people at the outreach program at deafblindness. So, if you can partner and team up, if you can think outside the box, if you can think big, you will help your patients. Join pot, all right? Don't smoke it, join it. All right. Uh, what happens? Learning happens in the school. Learning happens at home. Learning happens on the internet when parents at night look for things and look for resources. Learning happens, and what happens to Rubina and me? How did we have these careers? How did we do that? We did it because we have Jerry, and somebody's paying for respite care. When you have to sign off on that form and you feel, oh my God, this form and this people want everything, yes, they want everything because you're giving them something. Please sign. Somebody will abuse you on that form. Somebody will cheat you, but not everyone is out there to do that. 
patients want the resources. You name it, you give them the resource, they will do the rest. Look at her success. Okay. This is a big problem. And it'll take a lifetime of working to, to fix this. Um, I do have to tell the story. I'm sorry. This is another negative. We worked to one of the greatest retinal specialists, not retinal specialists, yeah, retinal specialists in this town, pediatric retinal specialists. We go into the room, we wait a while, this person comes in, opens the door, and says she's blind. That's an ophthalmologist telling she's blind. Yeah, we know. She's five years old, we know she's blind. Or uh, three years old or something. She'll never see. And did you see that nystagmus? Her eyes are moving like that because, yes, she's blind, so blind people have nystagmus, yes. Uh, and let me tell you, if you don't fix your marriage, you'll end up in divorce. That's what happens with blind children's parents. And then she walked out. I gave the gender, I'm sorry. And opened the door, and I said, but she tracks a red light because we had dragged Christmas lights across the floor, and that's how we taught her to learn to crawl when she was one, two years old. Because she tracked a red light in a dark room. And you know what the lady said when she walked out? She said, coincidence, and shut the door. Thank you for my $250 and nothing, nothing. Please, none of you be like that. None of you. I'm sorry if I'm like this, but there are good stories I've given you, and I'm giving you some of these. So young man died fast, suddenly. He was always said he was as old as the hills, and he was our guru. And he was the person who went behind the iron curtain when the fall of uh, the Berlin Wall came, and he found all these people in Hungary and Czechoslovakia in mental asylums rocking like this. And all they were were deaf blind. They were nothing else. But because they were tactile defensive and they had never got any communication. So if he didn't do this, the consequence would be she'd be a ward of the state and you'd be spending millions and there would be nothing. This is what Jan Van Dyke found. And in all his research, in his neuropsychology, he just said, if you can insert a moment of joy, if you can see a smile, you have inserted some communication, you've inserted something. So we took that and we made this and we showed him about Mom, about touch base and he was very happy. And I'm glad we, we had somebody on this earth that walked a few miles with us that was that great. This is a deck of a cruise uh, ship. And it's a bad picture, but Tanya's on it with her keyboard. So why does she use a keyboard if she doesn't hear her? Well, there's vibration, she gets some stimulation from it. This is her relaxation. There's nobody at this deck, it was a really cold thing. But Tanya needs her downtime. So this is Seville and in Spain, and we've gone there and we're having moments of joy. Look at those smiles. This is on top of Switzerland, and there's us and Tanya having a moment. And they're really enjoying it. And this is Grand. Uh, Uncle Feroz was the, my sister's husband, who's, who's not here today, but, uh, but uh, Tanya's having a blast. This is swimming in Cat Spring, which is heaven on earth. I wish all of you could come with us one time here. Uh, and this is CJ, and this is the Joey. We chose Joey because he was the laziest dog, and nobody would adopt him because he was so lazy. But for that time, this thing works perfectly, because then he can sit in our lap and not move. All right, Joey, Joey, Joey for a time. Um, okay, and Tanya finds kitchens hilarious. And now she cooks <laughs> meals for us, and they could be. And she finds these blenders that are like, oh my god, there's all this vibration, and something comes out of it. Wow, that's, that's fantastic. And then she has achievements. Look at that person, Pamela, in the front yard, giving her all the claps because she did something great. She did something great. This is how you get that. And look at her. She's truly dope. Don't ignore the pot belly. Uh, no, it's not All right. uh, it is Tanya out alone in the ocean. It could be as deep an ocean. She's trying to float. Look how beautiful she is. She's so damn good looking. How did we cope? We didn't cope very well. We did not cope very well. It's not an easy task. Your families, diabetes, whatever it is, hypertension, they're not cope. Give them a little support, a little love. It's not that easy. We sometimes go well, but not. So this is a philosophical slide. You guys don't know who this is, but this is Pablo Picasso. 
It was pretty clear what's happening in these pictures. This is Guernica and Pablo, which is Picasso. It's not clear what's happening, but there's a war going on, and there's bow something, and you've got whatever, right? And this is Pablo Picasso, and I definitely don't know what the heck is going on in this one. <laughs> sometimes in life we don't know what's going on, sometimes in life we know crystal clear what's going on. That's for our patients, that's for us. Physicians, heal yourself. When things are not going well, get the help. So in the Quran, and I'm admittedly probably the worst Muslim there is because I like my scotch and I don't go to the, to the mosque. But in the Quran it says, our Lord is he who bestoweth upon everything its appropriate faculties and has then guided it to its achievement of its appropriate purposes. So none of us know what our faculties are and what our purpose is. Tanya doesn't know that, but she has inspired all these people to take a Friday afternoon to come here. To and she's She's created a touch base center for the deaf blind, and she will do more, and she's inserted compassion into some people more than others. So it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, we say. So you should have fun. This is, this is a really good time. Only cameras for the good times, never for the bad times. It was a great time. Really. I've been to hell and back, but hell is not what you think it is. It's a railway station in Sweden, the train stops, the Japanese and the Americans. Go click, 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 and Tanya has been there too. So we've been to hell and back, but please don't feel sorry. So this is River Oak. Someone invited us to, for Christmas uh, many years ago uh, when we first came to this country. And we were young and innocent and in love and shows. And we were in love afterwards and have been for 31 years, and actually for 40 years, 31 of those spent as married couples. But I went to a psychiatrist. I went to the psychiatrist for a year, and I begged Rubina to come to me because our marriage was going down. I paid $350 a pop in the 90s and no insurance, and he had Picasso's on his wall, but he saved me. And he said, hey, you can take some citalopram as a new drug, or you don't, you can pull some irons out of the fire, you can take it easy. But you won't. You'll continue to do this. So this is you are. And that's all I got from it. But I got my life back. I got my life. By that time, we had three children, diapers. We were refugees in this country because of things that had happened in Pakistan and all sorts of other things. But I got my life back. So if you need help, now there is employee help and student help and all sorts of things. Do take it. It does save you. By the way, Rubina resisted, but then she went. And then I was horrified at the things I had done. Also, I thought, and we talked to her. And then that was our 25th wedding anniversary. And it was fun, wonderful. It's always been wonderful. When you have illness, you need help. It's a village that raises you. And you, you need this respite. And you need somebody to raise you up. And we, we have allowed so many people. You don't walk around in underwear, well, I do. Yeah, you don't walk around in underwears in your house because you, that's the freedom that you give up for the gain that you get. There's Tanya in Hawaii uh, with Asad and they're having a moment. And then Sarah being always the one who doesn't want to be left out, comes and ruins it in the middle of it all. Uh, <laughs> this is that booming in day when we were having a great time. If you don't know about the slide, I was going for my US Embassy, well, my FM gems. This is the last day in the hospital, and Tanya threw up all over me, right <laughs> a minute or two later. Look, but this is a fantastic moment. It's a fantastic So learn to relax, guys. Do it Tanya style, so right next to a keyboard, right in the middle of everything else. This is manic energy. I tore up the whole house trying to make a room for Tanya because she was going to come home from ICU. You know, that's, yeah, I, don't, I didn't recognize how crazy I was. But that was it. But then I went and took a walk in Braces Bend, uh, in Big Bend National Park. And I went 13 miles up the Jesus Mountain Trail. And uh, you know, I really enjoyed it. And Rubina took on a career. And there were good times. We built a house. But what I mean by this is construct your surrounds. Make things that make you happy around you so you can be helpful. And if somebody has that, help them get that. Those are important things. Without those surroundings, without that support, you can't be yourself. You can't be a physician. You can't be. So 
There was a mini ICU at home, and Rubina goes to England for her brother's wedding, and her, her parents are with her. And I give her permission to do that. And then she gives me permission for me to do my next FM gems and leaves her alone, and I go all the way to Chicago. At that time, you didn't have online exams. Walk through the garden of life, right? You want to walk through the garden of life. This is a ridiculous story, but it's important to laugh at it. This is Brazos Bank Park. We go in for a walk, and we had a long oxygen cord. And uh, a little girl, three-year-old, says, Mommy, Mommy, what's that? And the mommy says, Well, that's some kind of leash. And pulls her daughter right. <laughs> it's, we found it funny, but poor daughter. What kind of a parent is that? They lost a teaching moment. We all see disability. We all see homelessness. We all see poverty. What do we want? I do it too. We should. We should look at it and build that compassion. We should help. Turning away is our natural reaction. Climb the mountain. It says 22 and a half years. But did we have another choice? One of the philosophical things that I want to tell you is we all have plans. Oh, I'm going to have a daughter. She's going to be so pretty. She's going to get married. And I think I'm just pretty and she's going to get married. That's besides the point. We all have certain ideas. We're going to Paris. We're going to see the Eiffel Tower. But then the plane lands somewhere else. So what? Enjoy that place. It's OK. All places that the journey of Paulo Coelho and the alchemist says, all places are good. You'll enjoy it. You'll learn something from it. Don't fight. Compassion is a muscle. It's on my signature line. I tell it to my residents. I'm telling it to you. If you exercise it, you will grow it. And if you grow it, you will be thankful for it. They'll come and use one and every day. It is true. There's tons of journal articles on how you can exercise the muscle. The opposite is you'll be disillusioned, you'll be burnt out, you'll be angry. Because medicine is a frustrating thing because this country has a broken healthcare system. So please, if you're going to enjoy medicine, your first year, I have a bully pulpit, exercise compassion, it will serve you well. It will be the value. It won't be the 200,000 and the 220,000 and the 800,000 that you're making to pay back your horrible loans. It's a muscle. You've been messaged. Thank you very much. Okay. We have a treat for you, for those of you who can stay. We are going to do, we need four volunteers who don't have any food allergies and who get anxious but won't freak out because we're going to simulate you by making you deaf blind and we are going to do a little thing. I have one volunteer there, I have two there, and one here. Can we, can, so we'll take a little break, right? I'm sure that there's a party break or something that people want, and uh, we'll, we'll bring you up here, and then we can discuss and see how that felt. And, uh, and, hmm? do, do you want questions right now, Joanna? No, but what would be helpful is if the uh, student facilitators just make sure that they kind of got their um, their rosters so that we can know who's still here um, while we take a little break.